Right? So design, thinking, human-centered design, it's about learning, understanding, and realizing. So, and by realize, I mean realize your ideas and make them real. And you'll notice that I say in every single stage, there's make, there's make more, and there's continue making. Right? Because it's not actually about thinking. It's not about sitting in your room. It's about actually going out there with your body, about doing things, and actually getting them out, getting them tangible, getting them in front of real people at every stage of the process. So, uh, if we think of design as three stages, there are ways to learn, and there are ways to understand and realize. If you're looking to understand somebody's behavior in a topic, one of the techniques human-centered designers use is to actually give somebody a notebook or a camera and they'll ask them, hey, tomorrow, can you photograph what you think are the most important or painful moments of that process? Right? And that's it. You give them the camera and they go and take photos. So now you're trying to solve a pain. You're trying to make something better. That person is showing you exactly what they consider painful. And then you come back and when you go and you have that interview next time, you have that interview around those photos. It changes the conversation completely from you asking questions to you saying, well, why did you photograph this? Oh, well, what's so annoying about that? What was the reason? Where were you when that happened? Does that happen all the time? Right? It's around something that that person is sharing. So as much as possible, we also like to let our research subjects actually share things themselves. Uh, and there's going to be some more there. So the interview, right? Uh, it's here because it's actually, again, it's the cornerstone. Nothing happens without talking to people. And there, that's me, by the way. Um, not one of my better days. Um, I wanted to share kind of what I think are like 12 basically most important points when thinking about the interview because everything's going to revolve around this, right? So know what you want to learn, right? So whether you did an expert interview or whether you are specifically looking for trying to understand behaviors around volunteering and why people do it, know what you're trying to learn with the interview, right? Because the design thinking process, the human-centered design process is just like the scientific method. It's just like your customer development process. You start with a hypothesis, I believe this. And in order to find that out, I'm going to do this, and I'll know it's true when I see this, right? Well, the interview is just another experiment. I believe volunteering is a purely, you know, these people just want to do it because they want to feel good about themselves, right? And so in order to do that, that's going to be the frame. I'm not really interested in all of the other aspects of their lives. I'm interested specifically around why they're volunteering, even though my actual platform has to do with mentoring, right? But now I'm specifically trying to learn about volunteering. So you always want to start with what you want to learn because you want to be strategic with your decisions for how you go about your research, right? Uh, know who you want to speak to. This is important. Audience selection. Uh, making sure that you think about biases, right? And you get to like photograph them next to ideas that they thought were important. When you then come back to share it with your larger team, you have those pictures to kind of like focus and to actually help you remember like, oh yeah, that was like a really important moment, you know, he did this. Photographs are very important and if you're allowed to do them, like please, please make sure that you do. They're great. Uh, they help you remember, they help spur ideas, and they help kind of tell that cohesive story of this person better. Um, one of the things that I think is very important is explaining your purpose in advance. So a lot of the times when you get and schedule an interview, you don't want to end up in the situation where you're there and the person's like, whoa, but I didn't know that we were going to be talking about this. I'm actually not comfortable talking about that. In fact, along the way, you may have gotten them to talk about things that they're generally bothered by, right? And now they're kind of excited about, you know, oh, is that like something you're trying to solve or like this and that or that? But they also just like you. If you made it to the end of the interview and you had a good conversation going, chances are this person likes you to some degree, right? Which means they're much more likely to, A, agree to talk to you again than somebody brand new, but B, to actually introduce you to somebody else, 
right? Because that's what you want is you want them to introduce. You want every interview to ideally lead to at least two or three other interview possibilities. Either with the same person or with their friends. People that you wouldn't have normally had access to without them. You'll find also a lot of the times, uh, the reason that the interview is so important is because the interview also changes. When all of a sudden you have, you know, a, what, what's, what's our next thing? Card sort. Right, so a card sort is a type of conversation starter, right? So let's say I came to you and I was like, can you rank uh, in importance the most annoying thing to the least annoying thing? I'm, I'm trying to do something around uh, transportation, let's say in Rio, let's say even as a means to make the city better. And then I come to my interview person and I actually come with these cards. I was like, hey, I've got these cards. They've got these images on them. Can you rank them in terms of what you think is most annoying to least annoying? And then they're like, yeah, sure. And then they start moving things around, similar to how we were moving the post-its around. You're like, oh, well, can you tell me why that's first? And why, why, did you, why is that less important to you or more important to you? Then that person starts telling you, oh, well, you know, I'm actually really annoyed by the bikers because I'm like usually late for work and then it's already like high traffic and then they're taking up a lane by being there and I can't get around them. And I've got a little baby at home who I need to feed, but unfortunately there's no other roads. So these fucking bikers are in my way, making my wife pissed off and she's kind of annoying. That's why I think bikers are really annoying because get them the hell out of here, right? I wouldn't have ever thought to ask that kind of a question or to ask about that experience unless somebody led with that first. Right? So it's the same interview technique, but you kind of start to supplement it with different kind of things. Right? So if you're trying to explore things on, on, converse, on transportation, you might organize things. If you're trying to explore things around healthy lifestyles, you might say, you know, bike, car, tomato, McDonald's, you know, and ask people to organize them. It's whatever you are interested in exploring at that particular moment. You can use it as a prompt. Another thing that this can easily be replaced with is very rough prototype sketches of your idea. You already have a solution in mind, and so you're like, hey, tell me what you think about this, this, and this, and this, which is kind of like an idea you thought maybe you might take your new service or your new app. Right? They're like, oh man, shit, that would never work. That wouldn't work because of blah, 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 blah. Boom, you just prototyped your first prototype, basically, right? You had an idea, you put it in front of a customer, and they told you exactly what they thought about it, right? So it's the same interview, but all of a sudden it changes when you start to add these different techniques. You know? It's all basically ways to get different kinds of stories, to spend more time letting the people you're interviewing share their own thoughts than you leading them. Because an interview is also a very leading process, right? The way in which you're framing your questions, you're hoping for certain kinds of answers. And sometimes in order to really learn, you want to kind of relinquish control. You want to give it to the people. Tools like this allow people to kind of do it themselves and to share something. Just like that camera study where I said you give them a camera and you ask them to spend a day, photograph all the most annoying moments you have with this software. You know, boom, snap a photo, snap a photo, and then use those photos to actually start that conversation. So, ways to understand and to realize, and a lot of them we've already done. So, the brainstorm and the make it visual. After you do your interview, and like I said, sometimes in the design process, you can do 10 interviews, 20 interviews, you might do 100 interviews, right? You might do them over the course of two months, you might do them over the course of a week, right? Depending on exactly what you're trying to learn. But regardless of how you do them, and regardless you know, whether they were card sorts or storyboards or this or that that you showed the people in the interview, you got a lot of information. You learned a lot, right? Even think back to the very first exercise where we did, how much information you immediately had about the person you were speaking to in the two minute conversation. Right? You had their body language, you had what they looked like, you had the clothes that they were wearing, you had the things that they said, you also knew a little bit about the aspirations, about why they were here. 
right? Why each of you are here and what you're hoping to get, right? If you think about all of that, all of those observations, you can then be like, okay, well then this person is like, you know, he cares about these and these kinds of things, otherwise he wouldn't be here, right? Or he reminds me of this. There's a lot of information that we capture, sometimes even just purely visually, when we're talking to a person we understand. And when you have all of that information, you need to make it visual, right? So you get your team together, and it's best to do this almost immediately after the interview. So if you schedule an interview, right, and it runs for an hour, an hour and a half, just quickly get your actual interview team, the people who were there, together to a coffee shop and be like, hey, what did you think was most important? What about you? What about the quotes that were memorable? One thing that I forgot, actually, in the interviews is that you want to capture people's actual phrases, not your summaries of those phrases. Somebody asked me about uh, framing bias. Is he still here? Or about how, yes, hey. hey. But how you frame a question gives you an answer. Well, when somebody yeah. tells you something and you reframe what they said in your own words, you're also changing potentially their meaning, but you, maybe not, but you are probably changing the way other people will understand it, right? So as often as possible, you wanna say things in people's own words. They said this and they did this. I have a photo of them doing that, right? Evidence, we're all about evidence, you know? Because a lot of the interesting moments in an interview process also happen when people are telling you one thing, but you're seeing something completely different. And there's like some kind of like a tension between what people are saying, but what you're actually seeing and observing and feeling, right? You may be in somebody's house doing an interview and they're like, yeah, man, I'm like, super careful with my car, like I got it to, it's gotta be totally clean and this and that, and then you're like, but your house is a mess, I see like cornflakes on the floor, and I see this here, and your shirt's untucked, you know, there's some kind of like a, are you just trying to impress me, in my head, I'm thinking, right? Why does this person, I'm not calling him out, saying you're lying, but I'm thinking, well, why does this person feel like he has to say this thing, right? Well, because maybe, where he's from, there's this a lot of pressure to be perceived in such a way. So perception is important, even if it differs from reality. So for me, that's an insight. You want to try to incorporate everybody who's in your company in the research process for sharing ideas, for kind of analyzing the research, for making it visual. And that's one of the reasons why we do it. Um, there are some photos that I can show you later in the presentation of that this is actually tame in comparison to some of the design like offices you'll see where it's literally like the whole wall is covered in post-its and it's all over the place you know i uh, was working with a friend and we were skyping and he saw me while we were talking i was like doing the same thing recording what we were saying and new ideas that sparked from our conversation on post-its he was like oh man you know i'm never letting you into my house <laughs> because he saw me on video putting all those post-its but then I thought about it, I was like, that's nothing compared to what my office was like. You know, when, when I worked internally kind of in an animation team, it was like all four walls were covered with post-its and you want to encourage people to come see it and participate. If you took photos, print them out, put them right there with the post-its, right? Because you want to see the people that you're designing for. If you can see them, then you're thinking about them, right? And if you're thinking about them, that was the same technique that actually, uh, and we're going to talk about it later, but when we were brainstorming and I asked you guys to imagine something that uh, Donald Trump would love, right, or something that your mother would love, that's the same way that, you know, when you're thinking about personas or when you're designing for your people. When you have somebody that you understand so kind of like vividly, I think I want it to flow this way and then, you know, this is how I'm going to explore this thing. And it's got, you know, somebody can look at this I could have shown this to somebody beforehand and been like, hey, what do you think? And there's enough information on here, right, that they start to see here. You can see, right? Oh, that's the activity that we did at the front. That's that other activity. These are the illustrations. Oh, that's the activity that we're doing now. It's actually, it's clear enough that it's a real thing and somebody can give me actual feedback around this thing. But it took me, you know, maybe 30 minutes to make whereas in the presentation could have taken me four hours to make, right? But making a paper prototype would have allowed me to get feedback from somebody faster 
so that I didn't spend needless time perfecting slides, although you can tell I didn't spend needless time <laughs> perfecting slides to get something to look pretty, but you know, that's the goal, right? So paper prototyping, and I'm gonna show you some examples of what that looks like. Then personas, right? So personas are a kind of a complex thing, right? So if you talk to 100 people, there's no way you're gonna design for all 100 people, right? In the same way, you start to explore different commonalities behind, oh, well, it seems that these 25 people have this kind of a behavior. And these 10 people have this kind of behavior, right? So you start to group the things you learn about those people, the things that their emotions, their values, their beliefs, into a kind of a persona. You want to make that persona visual. You want it to have a face. You know, you want it to be something that you empathize with and that your larger design team. Because at a certain point in your design process, you're going to bring in different team members, right? So if you're doing design research, you don't need a graphic designer, right? But when your prototypes start to get to a higher level of fidelity, you need a graphic designer because you don't have those skills, right? So you need to be able to get that graphic designer up to speed on all the things that were important, right? You need to give them a brief. Personas help them do that because it helps that person absorb the 100 interviews that you did that they can very clearly get around a face, around a set group of behaviors, beliefs, fears, and emotions. From you thinking about the details of like, man, you know, like, do we need this color, do we need that color, to all of a sudden trying to actually envision this, not just with your end users, but in their actual lives, right? When are they gonna use it? Is John in the kitchen when he's looking at the app, or is he on the bus, right? Is he in the hospital, or is he here? It gets you thinking about when, how people are actually interacting with your, with your service, with your product, what are the circumstances, and how those circumstances affect them. You wouldn't be able to really unlock that kind of thinking unless you thought about it in terms of a story. This also becomes extremely powerful when you then take that story and you come back, storyboard, and you come back to your interview, and you'd be like, hey, take a look at this and tell me what you think. Right, and then the person's like, oh man, but that would never happen. Because in this situation, I'm doing this or that. It's like, oh my God, but I have that exact same problem. It changes the conversation around a concrete idea. And the same thing, your storyboards, like any story could be used to particularly try to understand some kind of a situation or some kind of an interaction. Uh, and depending on what you're trying to understand will change what kind of answers you get. Journey maps are an um, extremely useful tool. They're kind of almost like storyboards, but they're just very simple. They map when somebody first hears about your service to all the steps along the way of how they actually interact. It allows you to understand the different touch points, right? What's the person feeling when he's just heard about it from his friend? How can you control what kind of information that friend is conveying? What's that person thinking when all of a sudden his first interaction is with the cell phone app instead of the physical location? Blah, 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 right? You kind of map out exactly what steps a person goes through when they're using your service, and you try to understand their emotional level, their thoughts, what they're feeling or thinking at a different time. From the customer perspective, they give you like trigger questions to understand customer jobs. These are just the things that customers need to do customer pains, the things that bother them, the things that annoy them, the things that they don't like, that create negative emotions, and customer gains, things that people want, things that people hope for, things that people aspire for, or things that they don't even know that they hope and aspire for, but that they would love. From the business side, you've got your business functions, which needs to match with the customer jobs. Because it doesn't matter how many pains and gains you solve, if you're not actually helping them do what they need to do, you don't have a product, right? But even if you are helping them do what they need to do, if you're not solving any of their emotional needs, if you're not addressing any of those pains, your competitors are. And if you're not creating any gains, if you're not creating unintended outcomes, then again, you're, you're not creating value for the customer. And so it's a really fantastic tool to very quickly and visually map out those different elements, some emotional, some future thinking, and some very specific and feature-wise 
for do you have alignment between what your customers want and what your business is offering? And hint, the whole right side that is all about your customers' jobs, pains, and gains comes straight out of all the interviews, the observations, the shadow days. Once you do all of that in your distilling and your synthesizing, you're pulling those out too, right? You're trying to understand that they're the same, it's, it's a different kind of persona even. The business model canvas then zooms out a little bit from just your service offering and your customer to your service offering, your key partners, how you're delivering the service, right? It's how you're spending money and how you're making money. And it kind of allows you to very quickly prototype maybe even five different variations of how your business is gonna make money, right? It can very quickly show you five different alternatives for quickly making money and generating it. We'll get into a little bit of that. Wizard of Oz, one of my favorite, and I think most people forget this, is especially when you're talking about a service, a digital service, or anything that involves a lot of code, a lot of the time you can pretend that all of that already exists by simply putting a person on the other side, right? So somebody thinks that it's an automated process, they're texting me, and it's like supposedly the system that's spitting back out information, but really it's me moving everything along, but they don't know, right? And so it allows you to kind of think well, without a coder, without a developer, how can I very quickly prototype my concept without having to invest in a single line of code and test something out? And a lot of the times you'll find you can literally just fake it. Fake it, as long as your customer doesn't know, you'll be able to actually capture real responses and let you know if you're moving in the right direction, right? Because depending on which stage of the idea that you're in, depending on how much you understand, Spending time developing could be a huge loss of money, right? Just like how spending time on a graphic designer early in the process could also be. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes the difference between immediate feedback is purely how something looks. And there are those situations, but then other times you have to be aware, right? How to use your money most effectively and how to fake it so that you actually can still prototype and move forward as you go. That's the wizard of us. Uh, the next thing is ranking insights. Um, it's kind of a, you can ask like the card sort, getting people to put things that they think are more important can let you know what you need to concentrate on first. But it's also about when you're doing customer research and you're pulling out these personas and let's say you've got 20 different things that annoy all of these customers, how do you know which one to go after first? How do you know which one is you need right now and which one you can do next year, right? And that's a specific thing that you have to test for in order to find out, well, which one is more painful or which one is not being addressed by any of my competitors? You know, which pains can I target? And you wanna be strategic because you're never going to solve all of the problems, right? What you wanna do is you wanna solve a few of the problems really, really well. And in order to do that, you need to understand which are the problems you need to solve. And um, in customer development and business thinking, the same thing goes with your prototypes, right? There's absolutely no point in me prototyping if people like the color blue or red for the app when I haven't figured out if people have this problem. Because then it doesn't matter if it's blue or red, because I don't even know if they have this problem. Right? So when you start out and you're thinking about what you're making, you have to list your assumptions. And this is something you do kind of like as a team. Like, we think this is the situation, right? We think the world is like this. We think people act this way. We think people want these things. And we think people have this one concrete pain or behavior or whatever it is. You can list out all of your team's assumptions. They could be around finances. They could be around you know, access to capital. They could be around shared information. They could be around anything. It's an assumption. An assumption is something that you haven't yet proven is true. It's something you think is true, but you don't know. You need proof. And what you want to do is with your prototypes, you want to work top down. You want to take, basically, you rank your insights and your assumptions, where at the very top, you have 
if this assumption is proven false, the whole thing can be thrown out of the garbage. Nothing below matters if this is not true, right? And you don't want to do a single prototype down here until you do that one. That's the one you go after first. And then you go for the next important assumption. You always want to go from the one that's going to break your whole service. Because again, your goal is to meander in the direction that you want. Not meander this far to find out that back here, you didn't test something, right? So you rank it. You have to spend time with the kind of synthesis to understand what's the most important and what do we go after first and make a plan. Uh, and then the next tool is video, right? And then so a lot of the times, in order to share a story back with your team, with your bosses, even with your investors, about how, let's say, realistic a problem is, or how certain behaviors exist. You can do stories, you can do interviews, but if you can capture it on video, it's a very extremely powerful medium because it very quickly tells a story, right? And you can also use, I'm gonna show you some super cool video prototypes that other people did about future visions that, you know, technology that doesn't even exist yet, but with like some video and some After Effects, all of a sudden we can paint a picture like, well, this is, this is real life, right? This is how it's like and this is how we can feel it. And so I'll show you that. So uh, the rest of it is now me showing you specific examples of a future in which any of these ideas are possible. That's the one thing that you always kind of want to keep coming back to is not what you're seeing, but why you're seeing it, right? Because the why is the part that gets people to do things. Everybody's probably seen the, the TED talk about people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Maybe somebody's seen it, but it's true. People buy why you do something. Mission, mission-driven organizations, the same thing about people. That prototype doesn't give you the result that you want, but you learn something. This took 10 minutes, but it completely changed the whole conversation that the team was having around the problem topic, because all of a sudden, even in this very rough stage, you can kind of understand, okay, basically this is like a scroll function, right? And then these are either indicators or their buttons or whatever, right? Over here, you can kind of see more. You know, I can do here, oh, like there's a conversation going around. And all of a sudden, it took it to the conversation to a different level. We invited some people to even come look at it and give us feedback. Sometimes this level of fidelity is enough for you to learn what you want to learn. Right? Because if you're not interested in UX, but you're interested in like, what do you think of this kind of an idea where people can talk on the phone about these kinds of issues, they're like, oh man, that's kind of cool. You mean you would be just like Facebook? You know, you get that idea. You know, it's obviously you could flesh it out and waste lots of time, or you can very quickly learn, is this even a direction I need to move in? And at the very beginning, that's the question that you need to be asking is not, is this red or is this blue, but is this the right direction? Because I can make 10 of these prototypes in two hours, right? Going and finding and slowly getting there. Now, that aspect. I don't care about the rest of the service. I simply only care about that thing, this one thing. Voila, right? Yeah, and then role playing, right? Okay. Um, no graphic designer, no development, yet immediately a very tangible, this is the size of a phone, and somebody can actually play with it, they can see it. It reminds them enough about the experience that their brain does the rest. They suspend their disbelief. You'll find that people will do this for you all the time, your users and your prototypes. Do not worry about how finished something looks, how polished something looks. Worry about making sure that your prototype is giving you the learning you want. Right? It's not about how it looks or what it does, it's about will it give you the answer you're looking for or the thing you're trying to find out. Uh, something that I think is even easier than even that is you take your iPhone, you trace it, Right? And you trace it a few times, and then you draw in that same size, whatever your screens are, then you snap all those photos and you crop them. 
and then voila, they're in your photo app. Boom, 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 actually on your phone. So not even cardboard, but in 10 minutes, you drew everything out on paper, snapped a photo of it, and all of a sudden you've got an actual prototype with nobody who needed to know UX Paint or Balsamic or Envision or any of, any of that good stuff. You'll get there once you get to a certain point, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't do a paper prototype right now, and there's no reason why you can't do 20 paper prototypes in order to find something out. Because sometimes it's literally as simple as drawing it on a piece of paper and snapping that photo and giving somebody your phone to play with, right? You can do a lot of those in a day. Uh, another paper prototype, which is super cool, I think. This one's, imagine you're prototyping a product. So I don't know exactly what they were looking to explore. It could have been people's perceptions on portion size with what they think is okay to eat with a meal versus what's actually okay to eat with a meal. They could have actually been prototyping a new kind of plate, maybe to help uh, lower income kids be able to like better manage their diets, to have a better, healthier balance between the good stuff and the not good stuff. But if it, regardless if it was a product or a conversation or service, that took probably like five minutes. And you have a real physical tactile thing that you can then go and take and have a conversation. Or if this isn't even to talk to your customers, if this is to work with your designers, all of a sudden you and your whole team has a conversation around an actual object that you can touch, that you can feel, that you can play with, all in the span of 10 minutes. Maybe not even. Paper plate, straw, some glue, and some tape. Right? But you take that then to your audience and you have a completely different conversation. They printed out a poster. They printed out a second little piece of paper. And they printed out a third little poster. And they picked the public space. And then they just brought it out into the world and they pretended that this was real, that this was happening. Inviting people to join. seeing real strangers actually hopping on and joining them, and then giving them feedback about what needs to be changed. Because that's the kind of stuff that'll happen in real life, is that you'll start to get like, oh, you know, you guys are doing this for the first time, it'd be really cool if you, know, if you did it something like this and like this and like that. And that's when your customers start to get involved with your journey of actually creating something and making something, and then they start to feel ownership of it. And then the more they help them, and the more you actually involve your customers in the process, the more they become advocates for your service when it's actually delivered. Be like, oh my god, you have to talk to my friend, he would love this idea. It's like, oh hey Johnny, like you don't even understand, these guys, they're super cool, they're making like the world's best like thing, la 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 la, like come check it out. That's what you want. You want that kind of level of fanaticism. And that really starts to come out when you involve people in that process and you allow them to feel ownership of it. This is how you're making money. This is how you're spending money. These are the key things that you need to be able to do in order to deliver your things. And these are the key resources that you need to have. But these are the key partners that you need to work with. Because you're never going to do everything in, in this service delivery. Some things you partner with other people to do. You, know? you kind of share it. And so you can see that it's literally, it's, made, it's almost this big in real life smaller, but it's made for post-its the same way. You come and you take a post-it like boom, boom, boom. A technique and a trick to use is to use color to very quickly understand. You know, this is my green value offering to my green customer, and this is how the green customer is paying me money. But at the same time, I have a yellow customer who's a different demographic and maybe a different persona. Right, so each of your personas could be different colors, and you can very quickly see through color exactly how it's making sense or how it's not making sense. The most important thing is to constantly be learning, 
and to be methodical about your learning, right? So you're not just making prototypes for making prototypes sake, you're making specific prototypes because you're looking for specific answers to questions that you have. Regard depending on what kind of questions you have, it's gonna change the kinds of prototypes you do, right? And then depending on where you are in your process, it's going to change the amount of prototypes that you're able to make and that you need to make, right? In the beginning, because there are so many questions, there are so many unknowns, if you keep things cheap and you keep things fast, you can make 20 prototypes in a week and get them in front of your customers. If you remember the rules, right? Make sure to be attentive to people's needs, be honest about what you want, and always open doors at the end, right? If you keep to a standard of ethics, people will respond to that and they will gladly introduce you to your friends, right? One of the things that I didn't mention, and this was like for me an extremely like stressful moment, but it was really fun, was I was at another hackathon, and all of a sudden we had to do like, we were coming up with this idea and I needed to do a crazy amount of research. And I was like, crap, you know, like, how am I gonna get answers to these survey questions? I don't wanna do this blind, because me being who I am, I always need to add research into my process, even if it's a hackathon and it's 48 hours. I still like to have an element of real world certainty. So I came up with the survey and I'm like, how am I gonna get people to answer? And instead of doing what I think I've done in the past or what other people did, which is you go out and you know, like, you post things on a community or you post things on like Facebook and Hope, I actually went out and I messaged individual friends and acquaintances of mine that I hadn't spoken to in a while or some that I had. And I told them, hey, I'm like, I'm at a hackathon. I'm just wondering if you, know, you could spend some time and answer this question. I didn't do it as a mass Facebook thing where you know how sometimes you like, click all of your friends and like you send it. No, I send an individual message to each person and I got over 30 responses. Because one of the things that I've discovered, A, is that if you ask people for help, people are very willing to help you. And it's something that we project where we feel we're inconveniencing somebody, but in reality that's us and our own insecurities. And that you kind of need to let people make that decision, right? If they don't want to help you, they won't and they'll forget about it in like two minutes, right? But ask for help and you'll actually get it. And be genuine. Don't send out a blast email, but actually spend the time to write out the 30 emails. I guarantee you, you will get way more responses to people answering your survey or connecting you with people or agreeing to run an interview with you than if you had sent it out as a blast, right? Um, there was a whole other part of this workshop that clearly I talked too much, but um, yeah. Boom. No. Oh. <laughs>